UK and, and even in Scotland uh, or any of the vet schools with the kinds of things that were unique to, to their um, flocks like foot rot and um, parasitic worms and, and parasitic uh, mites. And so they got together and um, funded a small research organization that has now been around for 103 years and has evolved into the Morton Research Institute. It originally was based in the city of Edinburgh, which was obviously a lot smaller 100 years ago. Um, and the, the farm where they were based on the edge of the city is now the center of the city. So in 1990, the Institute was moved to the Bush Loan campus outside of Edinburgh in the foothills of the Pentlands, um, the Pentland Hills. And we are on the same campus with the Roslyn Institute and the um, University of Edinburgh Veterinary School. Um, we purchased the land that we use, so uh, we are the owners. And in this picture, hopefully my cursor is showing you the main building. This is our research institute um, with our um, administrative wing that has things like the lecture theater and the cafe and such. Um, inside the research institute, we have at least two um, BSL-3 laboratories. Uh, we have a third that can be upgraded to BSL-3 if we need it. Um, most of the laboratories are BSL-2, but there are a few that are BSL-1. Um, now occupying the basement of the um, institute is the Scottish Rural College's um, veterinary um, disease surveillance units and pathology units. We also have a um, um, veterinary virus disease, viral disease surveillance unit in the Morden, and they work very closely together. Up here, what I'm circling now is our um, research farm. So these are the barns where we do our experimental work. Barns can handle everything from chickens up to um, water buffalo. Um, we can do fairly large studies, we can get, you know, on the order of a couple of hundred sheep, um, almost a hundred cattle into these barns without any trouble. And we can do fairly large controlled experiments. We also have grazing fields that we can use for pasture based experiments. And um, in this set of buildings is our incinerator, but the center building is our high security unit. So we can do um, biosafety level three work with animals as large as, as full grown cattle um, in the high security unit. And we have done some significant work recently with um, Coxiella brunette, Q fever causative agent, amongst other things. And that um, we have a couple of programs internationally with the UK and the EU um, where researchers from anywhere in the world can come if they need a BSL-3 facility to do the experiments they wanna do, we can host them using that funding from the EU and the UK um, that they can come to Morden and do their work. And then these other buildings here are buildings that we actually lease out to over 20 commercial tenants, most of them involved in life science research and development. These are more companies that are doing diagnostics and, and things like that. And we do collaborate with many of those companies. So in today's discussion, I'm going to um, talk about vaccines in general and then why we um, are particularly focused on using viral vaccine-based vectors. Um, so what are the most successful vaccines? Well, obviously, um, vaccinia for smallpox, um, where Jenner noticed that the, Jenner observed that the, um, the milkmaids in outbreak areas were not getting smallpox. He, um, they had lesions on hands and arms from milking the cows that, that clearly showed they had suffered cowpox, but um, cowpox is a mild disease in humans. And so he conceptualized the idea of maybe harvesting the, the cowpox lesions um, and using that to um, vaccinate 
um, against variola. And obviously, that's where the term vaccine comes from. Another um, fairly good um, bacterial vaccine is Mycobacterium bovis, BCG for TB. Calmet and Guerin at the Pasteur in Paris, early 1900s, developed a highly attenuated version of Mycobacterium bovis and were able to show that vaccination with this attenuated bacterium protected against human tuberculosis to some extent. Um, it's, a, it's an okay vaccine, it's not perfect, but it's been in use for a very long time. Um, the, the vaccines that work really well are the attenuated virus vaccines, and this is because these are live um, viral vaccine strains. So they grow well and last in the vaccinated ind individual and they give long lasting immunity. And examples of this are the yellow fever virus, Rindipest, the Sabin polio vaccine, and MMR vaccine are all um, att live attenuated. Killed virus vaccines um, are the majority of the vaccines. Um, the uh, prototype example is the Salk polio vaccine. It's made exactly as the FMD vaccine. You, you grow up live virulent virus, and then you chemically inactivate it and formulate it with adjuvant. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the differences in a moment. And then there's also killed bacteria vaccines, bacterins, and diphtheria and pertussis are examples of that. Um, and then um, a very effective vaccine is the in inactivated toxin or toxoid um, that we use for tetanus. So in red here, I have um, two of the diseases that have been eradicated, um, one using um, vaccinia, as I explained, the cross-reactive live virus, um, and the other, rinderpest, where Plowright spent 28 years culturing rinderpest virus and testing it in cattle, killing dozens and dozens of cattle because it wasn't attenuated enough until he finally found a he finally isolated a vaccine strain that was safe for use in cattle and um, provided long-term effective immunity when inoculated. Um, the key to the eradication of rinderpest being a, um, a livestock disease was the development of um, the, the lyophilization process so we can freeze we were able to develop a freeze-dried version of the vaccine product of the virus at the end of production. And that, of course, could then go into vials and be carried at room temperature. All you needed was a bottle of, of sterile distilled water to rehydrate the vaccine when you want to inoculate it. So that allowed um, people in the eradication program to get into places that they not would not have been able to get into should, had they needed the cold chain that you need for most vaccines. Um, and yellow fever is, is one of our best vaccines. There's still lots of yellow fever around, but um, it's becoming less and less. There are pockets around the world that haven't been eradicated yet, but by and large, uh, most areas are free of yellow fever. The MMR vaccine is a fantastic vaccine that was on its way to eradicate measles and rubella until the anti-vax um, movement got started and people stopped vaccinating their children, which has been a disaster. Um, so the reason I have the Sabin and Salk polio vaccines in yellow is, um, as you probably know, we are just about at the point of eradicating polio. Um, the problem is in the last bits of trying to get to the final cases, um, it was absolutely clear that the attenuated Sabin vaccine had reverted to virulence to some level and was causing polio itself as opposed to protecting against it. And so um, WHO has taken the Sabin polio vaccine out of the eradication program and they're only using the killed virus vaccine. So why are they successful with well, the live and cross-reactive live attenuated 
vaccines provide a very long period of antigen exposure, and that results in generating broad and very strong immune memory. So it's very important if you want to protect against diseases for a future exposure that your immunity lasts long enough um, to still be um, effective when you have that exposure. Um, unfortunately for the killed virus and killed bacterial vaccines, it's a short bolus of antigen that is uh, the immune system is exposed to. And it's rapidly cleared because the immune system is fairly effective. And you don't get any generation of memory cells. And I'll show you a little data to, to show that in a while. Um, and it also requires adjuvants to artificially stimulate the immune response. And often the adjuvants have reactogenic properties. Um, the ma manufacturers spend a lot of time and a lot of money finding better adjuvants with less side effects. And so um, it's a major challenge in any vaccine formulation. The problems with live attenuated vaccines are the example I talked about in the Sabin polio vaccine is that there's always the possibility for reversion to virulence and then you're not vaccinating, you're spreading disease. Um, often the um, attenuated strains retain the immunosuppressive effects of the pathogen. Um, that's clearly the case in PERS, porcine reproductive and respiratory disease, um, respiratory syndrome virus, big problem in pigs. Um, the vaccines, even though they're attenuated, still have all the immunosuppressive effects of the virulent virus. And then con conversely, um, sometimes the attenuation, you lose the protective epitopes and obviously you reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine by losing those epitopes. And of course, if they require BSL-3 for manufacture, it's a very, very expensive vaccine. So recombinant protein vaccines are a um, large alternative, and there's many, many vaccines out there and being developed using this technology. So you simply um, manufacture a single protein, so there's no live pathogen. <laughs> Shall I continue? Okay, so recombinant protein vaccines induce um, antibody responses almost exclusively, no, no significant cellular immune responses, and it requires these adjuvants. And again, the energy exposure is very short, but they're very safe. So why are we interested in vi virus vaccine vectors? Um, they provide antigens for stimulation in exactly the same way as attenuated pathogens do without having um, the attenuated pathogen around. Um, they uh, induce both intracellular and extracellular um, exposure of antigens. So obviously by being viruses, the production of the antigen payload is intracellular. And you can design it to be um, exclusively intracellular, or if it's a membrane protein like a glycoprotein from a herpes virus, you can have it expressed just like that herpes virus would have expressed it. So it's on the surface of the cell and, and available to the B cells and T cells um, to respond to. It's got a much higher safety level. Most of these vaccine vectors have been extensively tested for spread and shed, and they don't do um, they don't get transmitted from one animal to another. In fact, in most cases, such as the adenovirus, um, they don't even get spread to another cell. So they infect one cell and they produce protein within that cell, and they never make any kind of viral particle to, to spread to another cell. So they're extremely safe. And there's no high containment manufacturing requirement. <clears throat> so we have a number of different vaccine-based vectors, uh, virus rather based vaccine vectors. Um, some of them are live. Um, 
So that will give you the very long antigen exposure that you get from attenuated virus vaccines. But there are significant safety profile challenges. Some of them not um, been demonstrated, but the potential for these problems um, makes the regulatory agencies very nervous. The most common ones and the ones that have been out on the market for some time now are the replication defective viruses. There's absolutely no safety issues with them, but unfortunately they have the same product profile of the killed virus vaccines that there's a very short antigen exposure, although you don't need adjuvants um, with the replication defective viruses. You can use adjuvants, and in fact, we have in some of the formulations we made for the FMD vaccine. Um, and then there's the self-replicating mRNA um, technology. This is the BioNTech Pfizer technology used for the COVID vaccine and also the Moderna um, technology used for the COVID vaccine. These are essentially chemicals. So you, you chemically synthesize the mRNAs. They're self-replicating, which extends the um, antigen production um, quite a bit over something like a replication defective vector. The problem with RNA, mRNA-based vaccines is the delivery system, and the delivery systems are very, very sensitive to degradation. So you are absolutely required to have the minus 80 cold chain, minus 80 centigrade cold chain to trans transport these vaccines anywhere, and they have to be kept frozen until point of use. <coughs> Pardon me. So one of the reasons I came to Morton, and one of the things we um, have available for research in livestock vaccines is a number of virus-based vaccine vectors that have been developed over the years. And actually, um, most of these have, have gone into field trials in one way or another. So um, David Griffiths has a lentivirus. This is the class of viruses that HIV, um, human immunodeficiency virus and simian immunodeficiency virus are in. These are um, small RNA viruses that, that um, get into the nucleus of cells to produce their, uh, transcribe and translate their viral genes. David has um, been working with a, um, sheep lentivirus called Mitovisna, um, which is a virus that causes Laupingil disease, uh, sorry, causes OPA in sheep. Um, and what he's done in, in his, one of his programs has put in the antigens for Laupingil disease um, and into an attenuated version of the Mitovisna. And he now has a fairly effective Laupingil vaccine. Um, he's also working on an OPA vaccine um, that hasn't gone quite as well as the Laupinga work. Um, but he's using, um, he's manipulating these virus vectors still. Um, some of them can incorporate into the genome of the um, infected cell. Um, and then you get propagation of the virus, of the, the vaccine payload for much longer periods of time. But again, that makes regulatory people nervous. So he has a version that does not intercalate that stays extra chromosomal in the nucleus so it acts much like the other virus vectors um, produces the vaccine payload but doesn't produce anything else especially no more virus um, i brought the adenovirus 5 system from plum island um, usda to morden and um, my postdoc that's been with me a few years now Stephen Chueshi has um, created a new version of the ad5 that is much easier to work with. And instead of taking four to eight weeks to make a new virus, once you have, a, have synthesized the DNA for a gene of interest, um, we, can, we can get that new adeno um, in about a week to 10 days. So he's, he's made it simpler, cheaper, and uh, much more effective um, to generate new adenoviruses. For instance, if there's a new strain of the of the virus circulating in your your herds, um, once we get the sequence of that strain, we can be making a new vaccine specific for that strain within weeks. 
Um, George Russell has been working for a long time now on the alcephalene herpes virus. This is the wildebeest virus that when it transmits to cattle causes um, malignant pteral fever, um, much like the ovine herpes 2 virus transmits from sheep to cattle causing MCF. Um, George has again made a rep made a um, attenuated version of this virus and um, he is now producing his um, vaccine formulation of um, this herpes virus and it's being um, manufactured in South Africa and being distributed um, to control MCF in South Africa and cattle. Um, he's also made the, he's, he's put the ovine um, herpes 2 glycoproteins into the same backbone and we are hoping to get funding to start testing that for protection against MCF transmitted by sheep. Um, and then the ORF virus is a pox virus that's been around for a long time. It was manipulated by our former um, director of virology who became assistant director for research in the Institute, but has now retired, um, Colin McGinnis, but he has passed on the technology to my colleague, Sean Matacadera, um, to keep that um, technology alive at the Institute. And Sean has used it actually to express the out of membrane protein of chlamydia on the virus vector. And he's vaccinated sheep with this um, this ORF construct and they've been protected against transmission of chlamydia. So that's got a lot of potential and we're very um, interested in progressing that program. So this is just a quick um, exam, uh, quick uh, cartoon to show you what Steven did with the, um, the original ad vector. So you can get the ad easy one system from Agilent Technologies. It's a kit you can purchase commercially. <clears throat> the problem with the AdEasy system is it uses a shuttle vector and the um, vector containing the adenovirus um, genes. So these plasmids are grown in bacteria. You put your gene of interest in the shuttle vector, grow up everything, and then you do a homologous recombination between the um, viral vector plasmid and the shuttle vector plasmid. And what you should come out with is an adenovirus expressing your protein. But what often happens is um, you get mistakes. So about 10%, 15% of the time you get mistakes. So it can, it can incorporate in a frame shift and you're not getting any protein made. It can, it can get reversed and be, and be incorporated in an inverted um, orientation. So it's not functional. So what Stephen did was he identified new um, restriction enzyme sites in the ADEZ vector, and he redesigned it, re reconformed it by cloning um, into what we now call the MRI A5, AD5 LACZ. So what he did was he put the LACZ gene into the um, expression site, run off the CMV promoter, the cytomegalovirus promoter. And um, now you just can get your DNA synthesized for the protein you want to express. It's, it's going to be unidirectional because the cloning site, um, they're two unique sites. So you just make sure that the compatible ends with the restriction enzymes are at the correct position, five prime or three prime. And then you simply cut the MRI add five black Z vector um, with these enzymes. You, you, put in your um, gene and, and it should replace the LACZ gene. And then you do transformation and mini preps and you can see immediately when you played out on the agar, put your bacteria out on the agar, the ones that have the, the insert are, are clear and the ones that still have the LACZ gene are blue. So you just pick clear colonies and you're off and running. So that all takes a week compared to the, recomb the homologous recombination system that takes about three weeks uh, to start looking for um, colonies that are positive for, for the insert. Um, and then obviously there's a lot less time and money involved in generating the, the new construct with our MRI at five.
So I'm going to quickly go through this. Um, it, it might, um, it might or might not um, resonate with the audience, but um, I just want to point out or emphasize that um, the immune response is, is um, fairly complicated and critically um, um, maintained by essentially the T cell response. So there are um, T independent B cell responses. They're very short lived. They're basically um, living on cross reactivity between what you're being exposed to presently um, and what you have been exposed to. So you have B cells circulating that, that um, can cross react with whatever the new thing is. Um, that's um, certainly not to be counted on. Um, but in the classic response, both um, the cellular immune response where T cells kill infected cells and the antibody response where B cells are driven to differentiation and produce antibody to bind the, the, the target, the pathogen in the case of what we're talking about today. They're all very, very dependent on the CD4 helper T cell response. And those T cells see antigens that have been um, taken up by antigen presenting cells from the exogenous environment. So from the circulation, from the intracellular spaces, intercellular spaces, et cetera. So these are antigens that have um, been phagocytized or pinocytized into these APCs, um, proteolytically cleaved in the endosomes and the lysosomes. Um, they are then funneled into the lumen of the ER where um, newly synthesized class two MHC proteins, major histocompatibility proteins, um, will bind peptide fragments of those antigens that have been chewed up. And if they do, they're able to be transported to the surface. And once on the surface, now the T cell receptor can see the MHC protein plus the peptide combinatorial epitope. And those CD4 helper T cells will be activated to produce lots of cytokines, they'll proliferate themselves. Um, and as I say, they are critical to both the B cell response and the cellular immune response mediated by CD8 T cells. Conversely, the, the um, class one MHC system that CD8 T cells respond to, um, they actually survey the intracellular um, areas because this is how we develop particularly uh, strong immunity to viruses. So the viruses are obviously intracellular pathogens. Um, they make the, the viral proteins after they infect and go through their life cycle. A lot of those viral proteins don't make it into viral new virus particles, but get chewed up in the cytoplasm, mainly by the proteasome. Um, and then when those, um, the peptides after um, being chewed up in the proteasome come out, they too go into the um, lumen of the ER and um, the class one MHC proteins um, can bind them. And class one MHC molecules are the transplantation molecules that are on every cell in the body. And this is why you have to do a, a tissue typing when you do transplant therapy. Uh, you have to match these as perfectly as you can so you don't get graft rejection, rejection. Well, these proteins are not there because of transplantation. That's something that happened in the last 0.0005% of the history of the human species. Um, they're there because um, this allows for the immune system to monitor the internal um, cellular um, environment for foreign antigens and then um, stimulate T cells let, um, in a manner that allows them to create a response to those foreign antigens. So this is the most efficient way to control a virus in, infection because the CD8 activation of the CD8 T cell response leads to cytotoxic T cells. And these cells can kill virus infecting infected cells using this detection system. So um, 
this is a summary of what I just said. Um, it, it, um, the, the helper cell response, what a, in addition to what I said, um, can also activate macrophages to, to control intracellular bacteria like mycobacteria. Um, and there's many other functions that the cytokines and chemokines that this class of helper cells uh, make to control infections, including parasitic infections, even large roundworms and things. But I'm a virologist, so let's con con concentrate on the, the tiny little pathogens I like to work with. So I'm going to give you some examples of how this all works from foot and mouth disease. Um, Using the AD5 FMD system, we were able to do long-term experiments off of Plum. If we tried to do these on Plum Island, they would be cost prohibitive because um, keeping animals around for more than, than four weeks to six weeks is, is just too expensive. So what I did was arrange to um, test the AD FMD. So again, this is um, not a um, not a, a restricted use pathogen, it's a virus vector, so we can use it anywhere. Um, so we went to my colleague's um, research facility at University of Vermont, and we set up a series of um, trials testing the length of immunity, length of protection, actually, of the new ad FMD. So it's, it's an adenovirus expressing an empty capsid from FMD, it's strain A24, which is just an experimental strain. It hasn't been in circulation for almost 100 years, um, but it's the strain we used. Um, so here are three panels, A, B, and C. In the case of A, we um, vaccinated the animals once, um, followed their um, virus neutralizing titers for six months, and then we challenged it six months. Um, in the second um, panel, we did the challenge at nine months. And in the last panel, unfortunately, we were trying to repeat the six month result. But um, at the time the animals came due for challenge, the animal house at Plum Island went down with um, leaks and contamination. So it was out of commission for about four months. So we had to just cancel that. The rest of that experiment it was very unfortunate. But um, so what you can see here is the virus neutralizing titers for all of the animals vaccinated with the ad FMD. We did a transdermal delivery with a with a uh, delivery air gun delivery device. We did IM and we did sub Q. In the case of the nine month, we only did the transdermal and the um, um, so uh, and the IM. And again, in the um, the, the trial that we didn't get to do the challenge. It was just the, the transdermal and the IM. So they all had excellent neutralizing titers right up until the challenge date. Even in the case of nine months, the transdermal, that's the, the one in circles um, in, the, in the rust color. Um, they had very detectable neutralizing titers on day of challenge. Um, but if you look at the, the um, infection data so percent protection is the way we reported in this table and again we only can report the first two trials because we never did challenge the third time so at six months post vaccination with one um one shot of vaccine only one vaccination um we had 100 percent protection in the transdermal group and 80 percent protection in the im group and by the standards of um OIE for testing FMD vaccines, these would both pass the test. The sub-Q group, um, we only had 60% protection, so we didn't continue to use the sub-Q inoculation. And then at nine months, um, that protection level went down to 33% and 20%. So clearly between six months and nine months, um, the um, ability of the antibody response to protect had waned. And going back to this, you can see there's really not a lot of difference in the antibody titer. It was slightly lower, but it was still detectable for sure. Um, so, and, and the difference between six months and nine months in this second trial is insignificant. I mean, they, they, there's no statistical significance here. 
um, and they're not all that different. They're probably not statistically different from the 100% protection we got at the six month trial. So looking at the antibody data, we assumed um, that it was the antibody, but clearly it's not because, um, sorry, computer's not responding well. Um, because clearly you have a very big difference in protection where you have um, not all that much uh, difference. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is the one day of challenge. So these were all the same titerite day of challenge. And the day of challenge of the two vaccinated groups for the nine month, they were only down by, um, again, less than statistically significant differences. So I believe that data tells us that we cannot use um, amount of antibody response at any given time point as a prediction of protection. And then what I want to emphasize from um, the first part of my talk about the immune response is we were able to do, um, uh, we were able to measure antibody secreting cells with a fairly sensitive assay that we developed at Plum. And here, what I'm showing you is um, the uh, number of antibody secreting cells we took from the circulation at every at these days post vaccination, all the way up to the um, eight month time frame. Um, so this was the nine month challenge, obviously, um, that I'm showing you the data from, and. Um, what you can see, the green is the transdermal, the red is the IM, and then this is the, um, this is the naive. So you get some noise out of the naive animals. But we got a lovely I, IgM response, and then um, cattle are um, very much dominated by the IgG1 response from their B cells. The lovely IgG1 response, a little bit of IgG2 that's expected and a little bit of IgA that wasn't expected, but um, it's not statistically significant, but it was detectable in a number of animals at a number of time points. But what I want to point out to you is that after day 28, in all of these categories, we cannot find B cells secreting anti-FMDV antibody. Now, we went to, uh, my, my colleague was doing a, um, a persistence study um, and we decided to add a few vaccinated animals because he was going to um, sacrifice animals and then harvest tissues from the cadavers. And what I was able to get from working with him was one animal, unfortunately, at a number of time points. So one animal at each time point. And if we took animals, any animals after day 28 and looked at lymph nodes, spleen, bone marrow, um, and even um, BALT, um, we, we could never find um, antibody secreting cells after day 28. So this is a clear indication that no memory was, no B cell memory was being induced by this vaccination. Um, and that is a big problem because now you're living on the half-life of the, um, protective antibodies in the circulation. And as I just showed you, you can't really see much difference between protection and non-protection. The level of antibody reactivity is about the same, at least when it comes to virus neutralization. So um, the take home of this is the performance of the ad FMD is just the same as killed virus. And just like killed virus, you're living on the ability of antibody to circulate and protect, which begins to wane pretty much at six months, something that's fairly well known with killed virus vaccines for FMD. But importantly, we wouldn't be, we could not find any induction of B cell memory. So, so this approach needs to be upgraded, um, redesigned to try and get memory. And um, I'm gonna quickly go through some data um, to explain one approach we took um, that actually is probably not going to be um, useful in a um, in any kind of response to an outbreak, but 
maybe will be useful in any eradication programs. So I probably should have shown this before going through the antibody data. The ADFMD is essentially um, generating an empty capsid. So off that CMV promoter, um, you have the P1 components and the 3C protease. This 3C self cleaves everything, and then um, the VP1, 2, and 3 go together to create the empty capsid. So what happens if you take the 3C out? Basically, um, as predicted, the P1 doesn't get processed. So here's VP0, VP1, and 3 from an FMD um, infected culture. Here's the ad FMD, um, the, the vaccine that I showed you the trial from. Again, same as the virus, you're processing your P1. But if you, if you eliminate that 3C or inactivate that 3C, you end up um, getting the P1, but it's not getting processed. And that's, that's exactly what we expected. So what happens when, when you create um, a vaccine like that and then inoculate um, an animal? Well, our prediction was that because the, three, the P1 is not being processed, it's floating around in the cytoplasm of the infected cell of the vaccine vector infected cell without being processed, that is going to make it a target for ubiquitin. So the ubiquitin attaches to this, this rogue protein. What that does is target it to the proteasome. What the proteasome does, as I said, is chew it into peptides. The goal of the proteasome evolutionarily is to make new amino acids to make new proteins. So um, most, of the pep, most of the proteins processed through the proteasome um, end up as single amino acids and they go back into the, uh, get recirculated into the system to, to um, associate with uh, tRNAs and then um, be incorporated into new protein pre um, translations. But it's imperfect. And when you get peptides, those peptides can be bound by the MHC molecules I described before. And if that happens, these get onto the surface of the cell and then you can stimulate CD8 T cells. So that's the theory. Did it work? Um, here's a really um, neat assay that was developed by um, Pawana and Steven in the lab to show that when you when you have the 3C available, um, the the proteins do not get ubiquinated, but when you take the 3C out over a time course, the proteins become more and more ubiquinated. Um, this is going be and um, become available as, as peptide um, epitopes for the MHC to bind. Importantly, this is um, a fairly quick um, and pretty accurate, I hope, I, I predict, um, in vitro method to show that when you manipulated the, the vaccine payload to target T cells, you've succeeded. So if it gets ubiquinated, that's going to become peptides available to CD8 T cells. If it doesn't get ubiquinated, it's probably going to get secreted um, and become available to B cells to stimulate antibody response. So did it work? Well, yes. So here's um, the killing assay. So what we did was we induced these CD8 killer cells and then um, tested them in vitro on target cells infected with FMD. And um, what you can see is um, these are um, percentage killing above the background. The background would be the uninfected target. Um, and with a prime, the T cell vaccine was able to stimulate CTL responses we were able to detect. And with a boost, those got boosted significantly. You didn't see anything from the, the B cell vaccine until you um, did the boost. So you saw nothing in the prime and only a little bit after the boost. But interestingly, if you put the two in together, you got a fantastic response. And um, I'm not going to go into it, but basically what this um, shows is our hypothesis that to optimize the immune response, you need to stimulate both T cells specifically and B cells specifically. 
um, to get the best of both responses. And I'm not showing the data, but the antibody responses were actually better in these um, animals as well. Um, the problem here is we could only do an N of, of two in each group. Um, these were all done with the um, SLA, the, the MHC homozygous pigs that were originally um, developed at NIH in Bethesda in the US and are now being um, maintained by the transplantation biology department at Harvard in Boston. And I could only get these pigs once in a while and they cost $1,500 a piece. So these were very expensive experiments. So doing large numbers was not gonna happen. And this is just to show in one of the experiments, we kept naive pigs. This is a group of three pigs. And you can see the noise in the assay here in the prime and the boost, not statistically significant, but importantly, infection with FMD does induce cytotoxic T cell responses because, because after the challenge, 24 days after challenge, we were clearly able to demonstrate cytotoxic T cell killing of target cells from naive challenged animals. So these were the vaccinated animals. So present FMD vaccines induce rapid but short-lived antibody responses and protection um, last plus or minus six months. Um, at FMD has exactly the same performance characteristic, characteristics. Um, antibody producing cells um, are no longer detectable after 28 days post-vaccination and no memory is developed in these vaccinations. By manipulating the payload, we can target the um, cytotoxic T-cell response, the cellular response, and this has the, the potential to really enhance um, these ad-delivered vaccines. So again, as I mentioned before, the, the B-cell vaccine that we've already um, gotten licensed in the United States. Um, that is the ad B cell vaccine. That will be exactly what you want to use for an outbreak because it induces very rapid antibody responses. You can detect neutralizing titers after four days um, post-vaccination. Um, and the, um, the T cell targeting vaccine takes at least a prime boost regimen and probably would be most effective with a prime boost and second boost regimen. And these that would not be compatible with um, outbreak response, but I think it would be very effective in a, any kind of an eradication program. So there I'll stop um, just to say thank you to the many collaborators over the years at USDA. Jared Patch was the principal postdoc working on all the cytotoxic T cell um, assays. Mary Kinney developed the um, antibody secreting cell assay and the more sensitive um, ELISA assay. Jeff Furman was the, um, the person that started all of this before Jared joined the lab. And Juan Pacheco and John Arts did all of the challenges of cattle and pigs that I showed in these data. Tatiana Sitt was the postdoc up at University of Vermont who managed the long-term cattle trial with the ad five with a little help from Mattel, the grad student, and that was all in John Barlow's lab at University of Vermont. And here at Morton, um, Stephen has been the main player in all of this work. Um, we had a, we had Pawana for a year as a master's student. They developed the ubiquitation assay. Scott did all of the immunochemistry, the Westerns and stuff. Um, and then Sean, David, and George are my colleagues working with the other vaccine vectors here at Morden on a couple of programs, um, one for BRD and, and another for chlamydia. So with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it has been like, it is mesmerizing to hear you always, your knowledge is expansive in the viral immunology. So now this uh, presentation is open for questions. So anybody has questions, they can ask Bill. 
Yeah. Hello, sir. Thank you for the talk. So actually, there were no uh, these neutralizing uh, essays done after and after the nine months. No, uh, once so once the animals were challenged, obviously they were making antibody to the virus infection. So the neutralizing titers after challenge were probably mostly due to the challenge virus. Uh, what about neutralizing assays after the uh, six months and after nine months? So that because the antibody titers were pretty uh, high on uh, uh, post uh, in the post immunization on uh, six months and uh, nine months. So the antibody titers were almost same, but uh, what about the neutralizing antibodies uh, that were present in, the, in this? And there were no these T cell uh, assays done uh, on uh, six months and nine months? No, no, no. So the, the cattle work, we did not do any of the T cell things. That was all done in, in homozygous inbred pigs. Um, so that was a different it had to be done in inbred animals because I had to have control of the um, MHC. So in the cattle work that went nine months, once the cattle came, once the cattle reached nine months, they came from Vermont back to Plum, down to Plum. We put them into the animal house and we did the challenges. And then we only followed them for 21 days post challenge. And then they were euthanized. And was there any uh, comparative? Is like comparative neutralizing assays that were done after 15 days or 16 days after the immunization with the B cell vaccine or the T cell vaccine, were, was there any kind of comparison or there were just the titers that were measured? So I have all, the titers are all published um, in the papers that describe these experiments. Um, so all of VNTs and the total um, anti FMD titers, I just didn't show them. I didn't. You know, I, I didn't want to have the talk go too far over over time. Oh, so the title. Know, the if title? you look up, so the, those Pervez actually can give you the um, the references for the patch, yeah. um, the patch publications. Yeah. They have all the data. There's yeah. three of them. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, anybody from uh, online? People online, they can also ask questions. So, uh, Bill, I have one question. Like, uh, what are the other like? Uh, what are the other ways we can uh, induce the T cell ability? Uh, and whether you have checked that, Domna, how long this T cell immunity lasts after this vaccination? Yes. Yeah, so, um, we didn't do any longevity work with the T-cell animals because um, except for one um, series of animals, we um, we challenged and, and again, we followed them for 21 days post-challenge and then euthanized. Um, and, and obviously, the once you challenge, now you're not measuring the response to the vaccine anymore. You're measuring the response to everything. Um, there is a um, one series of um, uh, analyses with the um, the T cell vaccine um, that that Lassa published in Veterinary Immunology and Immunopathology. I don't want to waste everyone's time getting that data up, um, but um, we did actually three three or four three boosts and um, clearly there were memory responses from the previous exposures to vaccine when we got to the third boost because we we kept expanding the specificity so that was the tetramer paper i didn't you know tetramers are going to be a little difficult to explain to an audience that um, yeah. isn't um, working in immunology actively <laughs> So I didn't want to go there, but you can look at that last um, veterinary immunology and immunopathology paper of losses, and you can see what we got when we did multiple boosts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Uh, anybody has any question, audience? Okay, so I.
uh, Dr. Our uh, Professor uh, Altaba to present the vote of thanks to Bill. Hello, I am Dr. Alta from Microbiology, and uh, you have been kind, uh, always associated with this kind of function. I can see that since last two or three days, and you have taken time to be present here out of your busy schedule. So first of all, let me thank you on behalf of the organizers of this brain, this uh, program, training program. And we are thankful to the participants also who have been keen enough to go into this nitty gritty of all these training programs and this brainstorming sessions all along these days. We are thankful to the people who have joined us online. I cannot name one by one, but I think their presence has added gravity to this program. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for all Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, shall we end the proceedings of this bill? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Pervez. Take care. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Take care now. Oh, one announcement tomorrow in the middle of the ground. Back on Friday, I will now the vanity of the Okay, and